to chapter two of Chem 10. Um, this chapter will cover a couple different topics, but our first one here is units of measurement. And so we're going to look at um, measurements in general, uh, the different units that can be used, and then we'll talk about the metric system and some of the prefixes that go along with it. This, uh, this chapter is foundational for doing any kind of measuring in chemistry and how do we interconvert between different types of units. So here we go. So measurements uh, in general always consist of two parts. The first part would be a number and the second part would be a unit. And so in chemistry, a number is never complete without having a unit attached to it. And so my examples here are like 20 grams, 32 seconds, right? Because if you just tell me a number, like say you your answer was 20, okay, 20 what? 20 feet, 20 inches, 20 grams, 20 seconds, 20 minutes. Uh, and so without a unit, then your number essentially has no meaning. So always make sure that whenever you give an answer in this class, be it on the homework or a quiz or a test, you know, you give me a number and then you give me a unit. Always, always, always. If you don't do both of those things, uh, then you're likely to use points, uh, lose points. So make sure you always have a unit. So the uh, metric system is what we use in chemistry to measure anything, really. We don't use the English system, which is what the United States use, where we have like things like feet or inches um, or pounds, right? We don't use that in chemistry because chemistry is an international language. So we use international units. So we use things like meters and liters and grams and Celsius instead of Fahrenheit and things like that. Um, so this is the SI system. So the SI system is similar to the metric system. Um, most times we are going to use the metric system. Sometimes we'll use SI, um, but I do want you to know the difference between the two. So anytime uh, we're going to measure quantities or do experiments or solve problems, we are always going to use these units. And again, like I said, we're mostly going to use the metric system in this class. Um, so we'll use meters, liters, grams, Celsius, and seconds. Every once in a while, we'll need to use Kelvin um, for some things, like in uh, the next chapter. And we also uh, use kilograms if we're going to have very large quantities of mass. But like I said, most times we're going to use the metric system. So length. Anytime we're going to measure length, um, our, our base unit is going to be meters in both the metric and the SI system. Usually, though, um, chemists use centimeters because we're not doing things that are quite so long, right? A meter stick is about a yard, right? If you look here, um, people often use the terms meter stick and yard stick interchangeably, but they're actually different. A meter stick, uh, you'll see, goes to 100 centimeters on one side, and a yard stick won't. But sometimes they'll have, you know, one side will be a meter stick, one side will be a yard stick, um, but, but typically in a chemistry classroom, you're going to see a meter stick. And again, on the meter stick, we're going by centimeters. And that's typically what we will use in chemistry because we're using uh, so much smaller quantities of things. Um, so here's some useful relationships, things you might want to have uh, written down or commit to memory. One meter equals 100 centimeters. And there are 2.54 centimeters in an inch. And in this class... I would always give you this one. I'm not going to expect you to memorize that there are 2.54 centimeters in an inch, although it might be helpful, you know, if you ever study abroad. This one, though, one meter equals 100 centimeters. That one I would expect you to know. And we're going to talk um, about these prefixes in a little bit. Volume, or the space that's occupied by a substance, is measured in meters cubed in the SI system. Um, but typically, we don't use uh, meters cubed or cubic meters in chemistry, because again, that would be a very large quantity. Um, rather, in chemistry, we're going to use liters if we have a lot of a substance, but typically we are going to use milliliters. That's the one we're going to use most often, which is abbreviated uh, lowercase m, capital L, and we will use that, um, or we will measure it in a graduated cylinder. Graduated cylinders are chemists' best friends. We use them to measure all kinds of liquids, um, and so, again, the milliliters is what we're going to use in there. So, again, uh, some useful relationships. One liter is a thousand milliliters. This one 
Again, I would expect you to know this one, and it's gonna be super helpful. Um, one milliliter is equal to one centimeter cubed. That is a useful relationship. Just if you see one centimeter cubed, you can know that that is the exact same thing as one milliliter. Um, but again, this top one is the one that I want you to know. One liter equals a thousand milliliters. And so this, right, this graduated cylinder here, and I'll, I'll write this out. This is a graduated cylinder. Um, and again, that's measuring a thousand milliliters up here at the top. So this is a one liter graduated cylinder. Mass is another thing that we commonly measure in chemistry, right? You might weigh out how much solid you're going to add to your reaction. Um, and the mass of an object is a measure of the quantity of the material it contains. We'll usually measure it on an electronic balance, like the one that's shown in the picture. Um, and it has the SI unit of kilogram. But again, um, chemists, we're not measuring things in quite such large quantities. So we are typically going to use grams in chemistry. Um, and so here, that's what that's what this is measuring. And if you can see, this is kind of very light, but there's that G there that's telling you that this is measuring in grams. We're typically not going to measure things in kilograms. You would just never add that much of a chemical to your reaction in a lab. Uh, and so again, some useful relationships between units of mass. This is another one I would expect you to know. One kilogram is equal to a thousand grams. Um, but this one, I would give you this one. One kilogram is equal to 2.205 pounds. And again, that would be useful if you're studying abroad um, or, you know, traveling and they tell you, you know, your weight limit in your suitcase is in kilograms. Uh, you essentially, you can um, figure that out using this relationship. Temperature, a uh, measure of hot or cold, right, is measured. Normally, you know, we would measure it in Fahrenheit, right? Um, right now, it's very, very hot outside. Um, and so I would measure it in, you know, I think actually today it's going to be 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty warm. Um, but in chemistry, we always will measure using Celsius. Again, that's what the rest of the world uses. Um, and that is going to make our math work out, which is always very nice. Um, so Celsius is here on the other side. And you can see we'll actually have some um, equations that will help you convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Uh, and then we will also measure temperature sometimes in Kelvin, which you may not have heard of before. Um, and the Kelvin scale is going to be really useful when we do um, some types of calculations. So again, we're never going to use Fahrenheit in this class, never, 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 ever, unless it is to convert to Celsius or to Kelvin. Um, sometimes we'll use Celsius, sometimes we'll use Kelvin, just kind of depends on what we are using it for. And then time, time is the only one that we... Um, you know, don't have to change our units, which is really nice. Uh, so we're going to use time in seconds, whether that's the metric or the SI, and you guys are all familiar with that, which is really nice. Okay, so this is the first time we've come across one of these. Um, so if you look in the chapter two module on Canvas, then you will find the chapter two lecture worksheet. And so I have these slides embedded in all of the PowerPoints so that um, they kind of cue you to practice what we've just learned. So I would, if I were you, pause here, go find the chapter two lecture worksheet on Canvas, and I would also find the answer key. And then complete problems one through three on that chapter two lecture worksheet, and then check your work on the answer key, okay? And I would always do this while we get to it in the PowerPoints because you know the whole point of me embedding these problems is that you get time to practice what we just talked about before moving on to new information so that it can kind of solidify in your brain before you go and we build on it. So like I said, pause here, go find the chapter two lecture worksheet, do problems one through three, check your work, and then unpause the PowerPoint and keep going. Okay, next topic, precision and accuracy. We're not gonna do a lot with this topic um, in this class, but if you go on to higher levels of chem, this becomes kind of an issue. So we have um, accuracy, which refers to the agreement of a particular value with the true value. So essentially how close you were to the right answer. Precision though is a little bit different. It refers to the degree of agreement among several measurements made in the same manner. So how close all of your measurements were to each other. Even if they're wrong, 
how, um, you know, how well are you able to repeat your measurement over and over again? Okay, so I have some bullseyes to kind of help us understand these two topics. Okay, so if we look at this, um, this, you know, the arrows are kind of all far apart and they didn't hit the bullseye. So this is not precise, not accurate, right? We didn't hit the bullseye and our grouping wasn't close together. But if we look at this one, the arrows are much closer together. Even though they didn't hit the bullseye, we are able to repeat that same process over and over again and essentially get the exact same result. So this tells us that we are being very precise, but not accurate. And that's actually an easy adjustment. It looks like this archer just needs to kind of aim a little bit higher and it's gonna hit the bullseye every single time. So here, all of our arrows are now very, very close together, which means we are precise. And now they have hit the bullseye, which was the whole goal in the first place. So now we are both precise and accurate, which obviously is what we all want to be. We wanna have uh, measurements that we can repeat and do the same way over and over again. And we would like them to be correct, what would be ideal. Okay, so um, significant figures, we're going to kind of do an intro to sig figs in this class. And they all stem from this um, precision and accuracy um, kind of topic, okay? How well do we actually know a measurement? So when we, when we take a measurement, like say we're going to measure something with a ruler or even with an electronic balance or a graduated cylinder, we're always um, estimating this last decimal point. And I'll get into that more um, in lab. But we're always going to have to estimate at some point, right? No, um, no measuring tool, whether it's electronic or with our eyes, no tool can be exactly precise. Uh, so that last digit, these last digits here, are actually going to be estimated digits or uncertain. We're pretty sure it's 20.1 something. Um, but these last digits are a bit uncertain and they may be estimated based on how well we can measure something. Okay. So this, this significant figures topic stems from, okay, we can't measure it completely precise to, you know, I don't know, 15 decimal points or 20 decimal points, right? We can't an infinite number of decimal points. We can only know, um, that value to a certain amount. Okay, so sig figs represent the total number of digits reported in a measurement. So if we are looking here at this measurement, there are four digits, 20.15. So there are four digits in these measurements. Um, so this is going to be four significant figures, but it's not always going to be the total number of digits in the measurement. And so we have some rules to tell us how, um, how well we know a number, which numbers are significant in these measurements. Okay, but again, it's always because there's an inherent estimate. Okay. So sig figs um, are only for measured numbers. And we're going to talk about exact numbers in a minute. And exact numbers are things like I have three cats. No one, I know that's a lot of cats, but no one is going to argue with the fact that I have three cats. I don't have like 2.9 cats or 3.2 cats, right? I have, I have three just, and, and that's it. Um, so those are going to be things like, those are exact numbers, things that we can count. Like you have five fingers, you don't have, you know, five and a half. Well, I mean, somebody might, but probably you don't. Um, but significant figures are always going to be for measured numbers. So anytime we make a measurement, we always need to think about how many significant figures we have. Okay. So here's our rules. Any digits numbers one to nine are significant. So anytime you see a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that is a significant number. But the zeros, the zeros are what cause us trouble. Okay. So zeros are only significant sometimes. So our first one is if a zero follows a decimal point, and I call this a trailing zero. If a zero follows a decimal point, then they are significant. If you have a zero between non-zero digits, they are significant. I call this one a captive zero. Um, and for numbers that are less than one, so you have say like 0 0.00, I don't know, two, right? The leading zeros, these ones in the front, <clears throat> are never significant. And then, um, yeah, so I call these ones leading zeros. And then zeros 
um, are not significant at the end of a number without a decimal point. So like, I don't know, 3200, these zeros are not significant because there's no decimal point in that number. Whereas if, you know, say we had this, they're significant. Okay, so we're going to get some practice on this. So any non-zero numbers in a measured number are significant. So if we look at this first one, 38.15, there's no zeros. So that means all of those numbers are significant. So therefore there are four sig figs in that measurement. The 5.6 feet, again, there's no zeros. So that means all of them are significant. So we have two significant figures in 5.6 feet. <clears throat> so when we have zeros between non-zero digits or captive zeros, they are significant. So if we look at this first one, 50.8. So that zero is sandwiched between the five and the eight. So since it's sandwiched between two non-zero numbers, that makes that zero significant. So therefore, all of the numbers in that are significant. <clears throat> so we have three significant figures. On the next one, um, those two zeros in the middle are sandwiched between the two in the front and the one in the back. So they are captive zeros, which means they are significant. So therefore, all of the zeros, or sorry, all of the digits in that measurement are significant. So we have four significant figures. Okay, so captive zeros, ones that are sandwiched between two real two other numbers, um, are always significant. Okay, zeros at the end of non-decimal numbers. So trailing zeros are not significant. So if we look, um, this is 44,000 kilometers, right? There is no decimal point anywhere in that number, which means that these three zeros at the end are not significant. So we are only saying that the, f the two fours in the front um, of this 44,000, those are the only significant figures. So that means we only have two sig figs. Um, and the reason for this is so like 44,000, that is kind of a rounded number. The, the fact that we don't have any decimals there means that we don't know it that well. It may actually be, I don't know, 38, no, oh, nope, that's not close. Uh, 43, I don't know, 972 kilometers, right? But we didn't know it that well, so it ended, it ended up getting rounded to 44,000. Um, and it's based on these rounding rules that we end up like this. We're not gonna focus so much on how they got to be um, the way that they did, this 44,000 kilometers. Um, we're just gonna focus on, okay, how many significant figures are in that measurement. Let's look at the next one. So 810 centimeters. So again, that zero at the end, there's no decimal point, which means that that zero is not significant. Trailing zeros are not significant if there's no decimal point. So only the eight and the one are significant, so therefore there are two significant figures. And then in the last one, again, no decimal point, which means that that zero is not significant. So only the six, the one, and the five are significant. So we have three significant figures. Okay, but now let's say, so in the last one, we had zeros at the end, but there was no decimal point. This one, we have zeros at the end, but there is a decimal point. Okay, so if we do have a decimal point, then the trailing zeros are significant because that is telling you that this measurement is more precise. It hasn't been rounded like this one, right? It's a very precise measurement, okay? Um, so here we have a zero at the end, but since there's a decimal point, that makes that zero significant. So therefore, the three, the eight, the one, the five, and the zero, all significant, so there are five significant figures. Again, we have zeros at the end, but there's a decimal point. So that means that all of those zeros are significant. So this has four significant figures. Again, we have zeros at the end, but there's a decimal point. So all of those zeros are significant. So again, trailing zeros, zeros at the end, are only significant if there's a decimal point. So if there's a decimal point, yes, they're significant. No decimal point, not significant. And then zeros at the beginning, um, or leading zeros, are never significant. So these are our leading zeros here at the front, okay? Um, and anytime you have zeros at the front, never gonna be significant. So the first one, we only have the four that's significant, so one sig fig. The second one, both of those twos are significant, so two sig figs. And then the last one, the three, the six, and the one are significant. 
Um, so we have three sig figs. Okay, so let's try this out. So how many significant figures are in each of the following? So here's a measurement. Go ahead and think how many significant figures are there? Okay, so in thinking about this, we have these zeros in the middle, those are captive zeros. So captive zeros are always significant, right? The one, you know, it's they're sandwiched between the one and the seven. Those zeros are significant and they will always be. The trailing zero, this one at the end, that's the one that is only sometimes significant. And it is significant if there's a decimal point, which we have. So since we have a decimal point, that means the zero at the end is significant. So the captive zeros are significant, the zero at the end is significant, and the one and the seven always are. So we have five sig figs in this number. Let's try another one. So again, we have a zero at the end, right? That trailing zero, and trailing zeros are only significant if there's a decimal point, which there is. So since we have a decimal point, that makes the zero at the end significant. Therefore, this one has four sig figs. All right, so this one, we have captive zeros, right? Zeros in the middle, these ones. And remember, captive zeros are always significant. So those zeros that are sandwiched between the one and the eight are always significant, um, but it's the one at the end, again, that is sometimes. So. The zero at the end is only significant if there's a decimal point. So there is no decimal point in this number, which means that zero is not significant. So we only have five sig figs, the one, the zero, the zero, the eight, the nine, but that last zero is not significant because there's no decimal point. So this one has leading zeros. So the leading zeros, remember these zeros in the front those are never significant, okay? Um, so since they are never significant, there are only two sig figs in this number. All right, so we have trailing zeros here. So trailing zeros are only significant if there's a decimal point, which there's not. So since there's no decimal point in this number, there are only two sig figs, um, that three and the two, okay? So I want you guys to go ahead and practice this. So again, find that chapter two lecture worksheet, and now you're going to work on problems four through seven, which will give you some practice on um, understanding how many sig figs there are. Again, always check your work on the answer key. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send me um, a message on Remind, or you can send me an email if you like. Um, but yes, go ahead and practice that and then come back. So I talked briefly about exact numbers before, and exact numbers are those that are obtained by counting items. So like here in the picture, there are two baseballs. Um, and since, you know, there can't be 2.1 baseballs or 1.9 baseballs, right? That is an exact number. Okay, so this has an infinite number of significant figures. So like here, this would be 2.0000000, right? For as many times as you can, because it is always going to be exactly two baseballs. There's no ambiguity. There's no like, oh, maybe it's 2.0001 baseballs. Nope. It's always going to be two baseballs because this is obtained by counting. So when we are counting items, those are going to be exact numbers. If we are measuring items, then we have to see how many significant figures are in that measurement. Okay, on to the next topic. So we're going to talk now about prefixes. Um, and in the metric and the SI system of units, you have a prefix that can attach to the beginning of a unit, um, and it will increase or decrease its size by some factor of 10. So the metric system and the SI system are great because it always goes by 10, and you're not constantly trying to remember how many cups are in a gallon or how many inches are in a mile or things like that. <clears throat> you just have to remember um, a set number of prefixes, and then it'll just go up and down by, by 10 or by 100 or by 1,000. Right, and our example here is the prefix kilo, which is a really common one in chemistry. Uh, and kilo means a thousand. So if we have one kilometer, right, or one kilometer, 
this is telling you that there are 1,000 meters. It's literally saying that, 1,000 meters. So one kilometer is 1,000 meters, 1,000 meters. Um, so there are going to be some prefixes that I'm going to ask you to know so that um, you are you know, familiar with these relationships. And they're all going to be based on what we, I was talking about earlier. Those ones, like I told you, you know, there are a thousand milliliters in a liter, and I said that was one you need to know. It's because I'm going to expect you to know these particular prefixes. So here they are. So kilo, um, and we are abbreviating it with a lowercase k. We're always going to use lowercase in front of the units. So kilo is lowercase k, and that means 1,000. Deci, we're not actually going to use very much, so you can kind of do this. But a decimeter is 0.1 uh, meters. Centimeters we will use, though. Centimeters are 0 0.001, like a cent, right? There are 100 cents in a dollar. Um, so you can remember that, you know, one centimeter is 0 0.01 meters, or you can remember there are 100 centimeters in one meter. Either way. And then milli is the last one. And so again, you can um, remember that there are um, 0 0.001 meters in one millimeter. Or you can say um, that there are 1,000 millimeters in a meter. And, and both are fine. Um, or milliliters, right? But milli means one one thousandth. So these are the three main ones, kilo, centi, and milli. Those are the ones we are going to use most often in this class. So I would recommend that you know them and know how to use them, but you will get a lot of practice. And so these, um, these that I've written, these, you know, uh, this equals that, we call those an equality. And equality shows the relationship between two units that measure the same quantity. So again, like 100 centimeters is equal to one meter. Those are the same thing. 100 centimeters and one meter is the same thing. Um, so like I said, for example, down here, one meter, like on a meter stick, is the same length as 100 centimeters. And the equality can be written as one meter equals 100 centimeters. And we're going to use these equalities um, to start to do conversions in the next uh, lesson. So when we're measuring volume, um, our, you know, our, our SI unit would be liters, um, but a volume of one liter or smaller is more common in the lab. You might get a bottle, um, like a stock bottle that has a liter, but you're never going to really use a liter to do a reaction. That would be a very large reaction. Um, and so instead we use milliliters. So if you take that liter, and divide it into 1,000 equal parts, then each one of those is called a milliliter. So we have one liter equals 1,000 milliliters. Um, sometimes you'll see centimeters cubed or cubic centimeters. Um, sometimes you'll see it in chemistry. Um, not too, super frequently though, but this is the same as milliliters. One milliliter is the same as one cubic centimeter, or if you work um, like in healthcare or you go into you know nursing or something like that, you may see like uh, one cc, that is one cubic centimeter, which again is the same as one milliliter. So those all mean the same thing. Okay, measuring mass. So um, if we were to weigh you, then your mass would be measured in kilograms because you're, you know, large. Um, but we're never going to measure something as big as you are out in the lab. Um, so we will often report things in either grams, right? Grams is abbreviated just G, <clears throat> or milligrams, which is MG. So milligrams would be something very, 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 very small. Um, we're typically not going to measure things in milligrams in this class. If you went on to very high levels of chemistry and you were using really expensive stuff, you might measure things in milligrams. But most often we would use grams in lab. So here is how they work. Um, one kilogram is going to equal a thousand grams. Again, prefix here, right? Kilo means a thousand. So one kilogram means a thousand grams. And then one gram is equal to 1000 milligrams because milligrams are very, very large or very, very small. Um, there are 1000 milligrams in a gram. I would commit these to memory um, as well as, you know, this one on the previous page. 
One liter equals a thousand milliliters. Your lives are going to be so much easier um, if you remember these couple conversions. Okay, go ahead and find your lecture worksheet. Complete problem eight. Okay, so we were talking about equalities, and again, equalities are using different units to describe the same quantity. So like one meter is a thousand millimeters, or something you might be more familiar with, right? A pound is 16 ounces. Or another one we talked about earlier, 2.205 pounds is one kilogram, or one minute is 60 seconds. So these are all different equalities, but again, they are talking about the same thing. And you may actually have seen them um, on packaged foods. A lot of times, they'll be listed in both metric and US units. So like here, this net weight is five ounces, which would be a US unit or an English unit, um, but they also have the metric weight, 142 grams, okay? And so that would be an equality. Five ounces is equal to 142 grams. So equalities are just telling you um, the same amount of substance, but in two different units. So here is um, a table of common equalities. Uh, this is also in your chapter two lecture worksheet, and I, I recommend that you keep it handy anytime you're working on these chapter two problems. Again, there are some that I'm going to expect you to know, mostly like these metric ones, right? Like I said, you know, one kilometer is a thousand meters, a meter is a thousand millimeters, things like that. Um, but if I ever ask you to do anything with the US units or the metric to US units, I would always give you the equality. It's only ones that I specifically state that you need to know that you actually need to know. So um, don't go into panic trying to memorize like all of this column. I would give you anything that.